the resurrection makes all the difference for all of us. We do not serve a dead savior who could not keep his promises. Therefore, we can take the promises. We can take the word, words of God as true and the promises of God seriously. More than that, we have a living savior who makes himself known to us. And this morning, we will see just those things in an event that happened hours after the resurrection. But the resurrected Christ has made himself known this way through the scriptures and through personal encounter countless times over the centuries. So for us today, we can be sure that you and I can know Christ in that same way. So we're in Luke 24, where we come to the account of two disciples on the road to Emmaus who came to truly know Jesus through the scriptures and through personal encounter. Luke 24, 13 to 24. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. That same day in this text is the day of the resurrection, the same day the women brought their report of the empty tomb. By that afternoon, at least two of Jesus' disciples have left and are headed from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus. Remember that the word disciple or follower is used both of the specific group of 12 whom Jesus chose and the larger group who simply followed. These two were in the larger group. We're not told both of their names, only one, Cleopas. Some people think the other disciple may have been Cleopas' wife. That would be why she's not named and why they live in the same house in Emmaus. They were on their way home. They had given up in defeat the idea that Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. They had left as soon as possible after the Sabbath. But as they walked along, they couldn't help but talk about all that had happened. And as they talked, a stranger came and walked with them. It was Jesus, resurrected. But they didn't know him. This could be because he didn't quite appear the same. It could be because you don't expect a dead man to come along and walk with you. It could also be that Jesus himself Jesus kept himself from being known to build their faith. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? Cleopas replies, aren't you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? There, there is grief in Cleopas' response, a grief that seems to lead him to lash out in anger. Jesus doesn't take offense. What things? And they say, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. Notice that they called Jesus a prophet, not the Messiah. I bet if you'd asked them a week before, they'd have said he was the Messiah. Maybe they were looking for that kind of political Messiah, a triumphal entry kind of Messiah. But they'd seen their chief priests and their leaders hand him over to death, 
They'd seen him crucified, and now their hope was gone. He may have been a prophet, but not the one who would redeem Israel. Even the early reports from the tomb had not pulled these two from the pit. Cleopas tells Jesus what they had learned from the women, how these women had gone to the tomb, had not found the body, and had seen angels. In his skepticism and doubt, he calls it a vision of angels. Maybe it was their imagination. And Cleopas doesn't even mention that these angels had told the women Jesus was alive, risen from the dead, or how the angels had reminded them of Jesus' promise of resurrection. But none of that was enough to impact the disappointment and grief felt by Cleopas and his wife, and I'm sure the other disciples as well. They'd heard the promises, they'd heard these reports, but they hadn't put it all together on either the head level through knowledge of scripture or on the heart level through personal encounter and faith. They probably let their preconceptions of Jesus, especially those of a political Messiah, outweigh the facts that they had just heard. And this still happens today. The cultural image of Christianity as patriarchal, homophobic, ignorant, cruel, that cultural image stands in the way of a true perception of Jesus in the facts of the scripture and a true encounter with Jesus by faith. Today I want to share a testimony. A man named Martin Wolf, who was in that same position, his preconceptions of Christianity kept him from putting it together on the head level through knowledge of the scripture and on the heart level through personal encounter and faith. So he starts by saying, I was born in a Jewish home and brought up in the traditions of my people. In our home, Sabbath was faithfully kept. On Friday night, as the sun went down, my mother would light the Sabbath candles and my father would say the prayer. Although I didn't appreciate having to go to synagogue or Hebrew school, as I looked back, I am very thankful for my religious training. For example, in my mother's life and the lives of the men at the synagogue, I saw a true respect and reverence for God's word. I thought, you don't show such reverence to a book of fairy tales. Thus I learned to respect and honor the word of God. I also learned about the Messiah and was eagerly awaiting his coming. I was taught to say, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah and I believe with perfect faith that all the words of the prophets are true. But that faith in the Old Testament left Martin, well, then led Martin into an awareness of sin. He says, how can I have contact with God as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets did? What can I do to be forgiven for my sins? As Yom Kippur approached in the year of my bar mitzvah, I really wanted to know. I was in the synagogue and saw an old man two or three rows ahead of me. He had a long prayer shawl and he was praying to God and beating his chest. I thought, this man must know all there is to know about forgiveness. I waited until the end of the service and then said, sir, do you know that your sins are forgiven? I could still see the tears coursing down his face. Son, he said, I only hope so. I only hope so. I thought, if he doesn't know that his sins are forgiven, how can I know? And I tried to put the issue out of my mind. But as I grew older, I realized that going through the rituals did not satisfy the longing of my heart. So Martin, Luf, Martin Wolf, at this stage, was someone who knew something about the Messiah, who even knew something about his need for forgiveness, but he didn't know Christ. He needed somebody to open the truth of Scripture to him so that he could know the way of salvation and the power of resurrection. This is what the two on the road to Emmaus received from Jesus himself, Luke 24, 25 to 27. And he said to them, 
Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Oh, man. This is one of the two or three times in scripture that I wish I could have been there. Christ himself explains how all the Old Testament applies to him. He begins by rebuking these disciples. How foolish you are and how slow of heart. To be foolish, in the word used here, is to be without understanding. It is to have knowledge without having the wisdom to apply that knowledge. But he also calls them slow of heart. This was not just a mind problem. It was also a problem of the heart because a true knowledge of Jesus Christ is not just head knowledge. It is also heart knowledge. And so Jesus is saying that both the head and the heart need to be engaged. But he goes first. Notice this. He goes first to the head and he shows them all that the prophets have spoken that they might believe it. Jesus claims that the prophets correctly understood show that Christ had to suffer the way Jesus suffered before he entered his glory. He explained what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And yeah, that's the part I'd like to have heard. Jesus went through the scripture book by book and pointed out each part that showed him as Messiah. And this would have been utterly awesome. We can see much that the scriptures say about Jesus, but Jesus knew it all. He later did the same exposition for the disciples, and I'm sure many of the Old Testament fulfillments that the disciples wrote about in the New Testament came out of that teaching. So my key thought this morning is that the risen Lord is known through encounter with the word as well as through personal encounter. Verse 32 tells us belatedly of the impact this scripture had on their hearts. Did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures to us? The scriptures reached their hearts. This reminds me of John Wesley's story. The founder of Methodism was already an Anglican minister, a missionary in Georgia, when he recognized that he himself did not know Jesus. Then one day in London, at a small chapel on Aldersgate Street, Wesley heard a man reading a sermon on the book of Romans, a sermon written two centuries earlier by Martin Luther. This sermon described real faith that did not rely on good works. Wesley could not let go of this thought. That night he wrote, about a quarter before nine, while he, the reader, was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins. Amen. His heart was strangely warmed. Biblical truth has incredible power through the Holy Spirit to be, bring men and women to conviction and faith. Martin Wolf's story is a modern version of the encounter with prophecy that the two had on the Emmaus Road. He says, in college I studied French, for I planned to be a teacher. At a French club dinner, I met the young woman who later became my wife. After we were married, we went to France to further my education. While there, my wife suggested we read the New Testament aloud together. Thinking over her suggestion, I reasoned, nobody in my family would know or could object. So I opened the New Testament and saw the first verse in Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I said, David, Abraham, these people I know. What does a Christian man, Matthew, know about these Jews? Then I found out Matthew was a Jew. I read a little further. All this was done to fulfill that which was spoken about the Lord by the prophets. The prophets? What prophets? 
the Old Testament prophets, I was told. So for the first time, I really studied the prophets, though with a belligerent attitude. My purpose was to prove that Matthew did not know anything about the Old Testament. But little by little, I began comprehending for myself the prophecies about the Messiah. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I found in Isaiah 53, which is not read in the synagogues, these words. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As the Jew wolf says, I had to be honest. If my own prophets tell me about Yeshua, the Messiah, I reasoned, why shouldn't I believe them? <laughs> Incredible testimony of God's work. These are the same scriptures that Christ shared with the two on the road to Emmaus, now being used to bring Martin Wolf to the point of faith in the Messiah. And Jesus is just as desirous of opening your heart by the word as he was those two disciples, or John Wesley, or Martin Wolf. The time you spend reading and studying and meditating on scripture will not just have an impact on your mind and your knowledge, but on your heart. But you know, even that is not enough. If all you ever have is an encounter with scripture, you will not be truly transformed even by those truths. Jesus himself, the risen Lord Jesus, wants to have a personal encounter with you. Listen to the end of this walk to Emmaus. Luke 24, 28 to 35. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Emmaus is only about seven miles from Jerusalem. At normal walking speeds, it would take about two hours to get there. But by the time they did get there, the day was nearly over. And Jesus looked like he was going to go on. But the two, no doubt influenced by the fact that their hearts were burning within them, urged him to stay. And he did. He went in with them, and when they prepared a meal, and when they sat down, he took up the bread to give thanks. Almost certainly he blessed it using the traditional Hebrew blessing, the same one we use in our Seder celebrations, but something about the way he said it or some action of the Holy Spirit caused them to recognize him when he broke the bread. Luke tells us their eyes were opened and then he disappeared from their sight. Now it's possible these two had been at the Lord's Supper, but there's no real evidence that others apart from the 12 were at that meal. It's possible the disciples had told the story of the Lord's Supper in such a compelling way that it made a strong impression on them. Or maybe this blessing, breaking, and giving was such a customary action of Jesus that the familiarity of it cut through their blindness. Whatever it is, it's clear 
but the Holy Spirit had been keeping them from recognizing him, and now those blinders are off at this moment. What better testimony could there be for us, for all future generations, than for these two to say, we recognized Jesus when he broke the bread. For those who are believers, the reality of communion should be that we recognize Jesus when he breaks the bread. But whether for us it's at that moment or in some other situation, we all need a moment of personal encounter when our eyes are opened to the real presence of the risen Christ. This moment has been called many things over the years, repentance, conversion, being born again, accepting Jesus, coming to faith, becoming a believer. But the thing in common is that all of these require a personal encounter with a living Savior. You, you can't have this kind of personal encounter with a dead man. I read the story of a man who was converted from Islam to Christianity. His friends asked him, why have you become a Christian? He answered, suppose you were going on the road and suddenly the road forked in two directions, and there at the fork were two men, one dead and one alive. Which one would you ask the way to go? It's the risen Christ who speaks to us through scripture and tells us the way to go. It's the risen Christ with whom we have a personal encounter through faith. I'm convinced but it was the wonderful reality of his resurrection that burst in on these two at this moment. Suddenly this familiar person was sitting with them, doing the familiar thing, but this person had been dead the day before. If he can walk with us, if he can talk with us, if he can break bread with us, he's really alive. What he taught is true. All these scriptures are verified by the fact of his resurrection. All his suffering, all his dying was part of this scriptural plan that he might save us from sin by burying our sins. His death, as Isaiah said to Martin Wolf, had a purpose. It was a substitution. He was separated by our sin from his father and he bore the punishment that our sin deserved. He suffered for us as a servant, just as scripture had said he must. Scripture teaches that there must be a sacrifice for sin. Jesus was that sacrifice. And in rising from the dead, he proved that death was defeated and that his promises were always kept and that the future held eternal life. He's a risen savior with whom you can have a personal relationship. That's what these two disciples are eager to report. They get up at once, they return to the city. I bet you they had a lot more energy for that trip back. And when they arrive, they find the 11 assembled, and before they can even share what's happened to them, they're told, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And we have no record of that appearance, but as I've often said, it was extremely significant for Simon Peter, a personal encounter with the risen Savior that changed and restored his life. And his report had already been believed, but then these two chime in with theirs about the scripture Jesus had shared, about the way they recognized Jesus. What we see in the scripture an encounter with the risen Savior is the same thing we need in our lives. We need that encounter through Scripture, reading and studying and meditating, but we also need it through personal experience of Him. He is risen. He is alive. And as we trust in Him, a heart trust, we receive new life through the Holy Spirit. Have you had a personal encounter with the risen Savior? If you haven't, you can in fact, you must seek him today. Seek him with all your heart. He once said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. He will meet you. <laughs> so before I finish the story of Martin Wolf, let me assure you that I've experienced that resurrected presence. 
I came to the point when I was 13 years old where scriptures were shared with me that burned in my heart. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That was me, a sinner. The wages of sin is death. That was my fate. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That was my only hope. And to all who received him, to those who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That was my response, to believe in him and receive eternal life. Those scriptures that evening drove me to tears, first to tears of sorrow, and then to tears of joy as the loving presence of my Savior filled my soul. Let's close with the words of Martin Wolf. It was with fear and trembling that I considered believing in Messiah Jesus because here was something that I never thought would happen, never in a million years. How do I know for sure, I asked my wife. Well, you pray, she said. I'm a, I'm a good Jew. I've prayed, I said. You have to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, was her astounding reply. I couldn't imagine doing that. But I did want to know for sure. So I decided to ask God. I, I do not even remember the words anymore. But as I lay awake in bed one night, I looked up toward the ceiling and told God that if Jesus was really the Messiah and would forgive my sins, I would accept him. If this is all true, then I ask this in Jesus' name. I thought the ceiling might cave in on me. So different was this prayer than any I had ever prayed. But the ceiling did not cave in. No lights flashed, no bells rang, into my heart, however, came such peace that I knew the prayer was right. I knew I had found the Messiah and passed from death into life. I had forgiveness of my sins, not because of anything I had done, nor because I deserved it, but because of what he had done for me. I had come to him with my burdens, and he had given me rest. I still continually Thank him for it. If you who read or listen to this account, Wolf says, if you have not yet found the Messiah and believed in him, you have missed the purpose of life. I sincerely invite you to consider the scriptures which describe the person of the Messiah. As you search the scriptures with an open heart and open mind, you too will find the peace of the risen Savior. The risen Christ is known through the scriptures and through personal encounter. We say it over and over and over again on Easter, he is risen, but you won't really know that until you're convinced from scripture and from the experience in your heart of his loving and saving present presence. And when you've had that encounter, that's a real reason to celebrate this day. He is risen indeed.